On this podcast, we're tackling Iron Maiden's ninth. Thank you for joining us again for another edition. Nick Mars, the guitarist, he said, I fell out of the chair because I was so drunk. But let's delve into it a bit deeper, yeah? <laughs> Is that you quoting The Exorcist again? <laughs> yeah, and Dave must eat. <laughs> and there you go. That's the most interesting thing you're ever going to hear about Saxon. <laughs> Monster! How can you drink that pack? You're getting on now, I'll be worried about the old intake. What are you talking about? Huh? Huh? I'm listening to you. That's it. I'll have to sit back a bit. Are you surrounded by cushions? <laughs> are you surrounded by cushions? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to kill me! If I move! <laughs> yes. Welcome to another episode of Nostalgia, where we relive our experiences as two young men living in a small village on the east coast of Ireland, discovering some of the greatest rock albums of all time. Today, Appetite for Destruction from Guns N' Roses. Nostalgia. Appetite for Destruction, Guns N' Roses, came out on July the 21st, 1987. It was released on Geffen Records and sold 30 million copies worldwide. So far. So far. You never know because maybe people will latch on to it again after listening to our podcast and go out in their swathes and buy it again. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't they? Maybe Would they? stream it. I read recently that Joe Elliott from Def Leppard, a, another one of our classic records that we've done here on Nostalgia, has said that he's very thankful to Apple Music and Spotify that they have made Def Leppard into a cool legacy act. I wouldn't have used those words myself, Joe, but maybe that would be the case with Guns N' Roses as well. Another thing I realised about Guns N' Roses as well when I was looking into them, they love to be in hotel rooms and spit at the wall. Slash mentioned this. <laughs> Duff McKagan. They were like, oh yeah, when we're in a hotel room, we can do whatever we want. Slash, he'd been interviewed by Raw magazine when I was doing my research and he was spitting on the hotel wall. And in Duff McKagan's autobiography, he was spitting on the wall. Duff grew up in the time of the punk bands, you see, in the late 70s and CBGBs and The Clash and, and The Ramones and uh, Hawken and Goblin was what they did for fun. Well, maybe old fashioned or, or maybe a bit, but have a bit of respect for the cleaners that are coming in and after you. Well, we have experience of Hawken and Goblin. Remember back in 1987, we were young chaps in secondary school, I think first or second year, that one of our friends was allowing himself to stand there with his mouth open and be gobbed into by others. I don't know if we were betting money on it, but uh, there was the gob fest. I'll ask you to edit this out, but but who was it? Uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, yes. Mush. 1987 was a different time. And as we prize open this awkward, scaly box again and look inside and see what delights it still can give us all of these years later. Appetite for destruction. Guns and Roses. 30 million units shifted. You're never going to get that kind of sales again. So yeah, let's hope we generate a few extra streams for Axel and Slash because I know they're struggling to make ends meet. Yeah, I believe they had to come out on tour again with some type of version of what they think Guns N' Roses is. And in fact, I think you saw them live along with other 100,000 gullible uh, people, fans. It will be the fourth time I've seen Guns N' Roses. So I seen them in Slane Castle back in 1992, back when they were at the peak of their powers. The week before, they'd played at the Freddie Mercury tribute concert in Wembley. Then I seen... I seen, I did. It's your Wicklow upbringing. Should I be saying saw? I had seen them or I saw them. Which one would you prefer, Adrian? Um, I saw them then in the noughties, I think it was. But that was nothing resembling the original Guns N' Roses. It it was just Axel. Axel and his acolytes. That would have been at around the time of Chinese democracy. So what would yeah. that be, 2004 or something? They had a really great guitar player called Buckethead who instantly realised he was out of his depth of the crap that was around him with these songs. And he gave it up to Richard Fetus or Fortis, I think his name was. And then DJ Ashbach came in and then a host of other guitarists came in. But sadly... Each to his own. And I each, mean, I'm yeah. amazed you, you kept track of that because <laughs> Guns N' Roses didn't enter my radar then for another dozen years, I'd say. I just did my research for this podcast. Maybe 28 years later, I saw them again in Slane Castle on the current tour. Not in this lifetime, I think it's called. Of the classic lineup now, you've got Axel, Duff and Slash. The problem is that none of these guys have died along the way. They're all still alive and that would predicate that they should have the original lineup of Adler, McKegan, Mr. Slash, Saul Hudson, Axel, W, William Bailey Rose and I, what was his name? I can't remember his real name but Izzy Stradlin. Not Dizzy Reed or <laughs> DJ Wankface. Just the original yeah. lads. Yeah, Matt like Sorum. Matt Izzy Sorum. Stradlin, I mean, okay, Matt Sorum came in on the Don't Cry video and he was in on the Use Your Illusion albums where a fair He's chunk of money. He's probably a better drummer than Adler in fairness. It's not about who's better. Lars Ulrich, come on. 
Well, he's, he's, he's the founder, so he has that right. Yeah, Stephen Adler was one of the founders of Guns N' Roses. If you ask me tomorrow, would I like to see Guns N' Roses with all of the lineup without Adler, I'd be happy enough. You see, there is that. I'd like to see that, Izzy Stradlin back. Uh, Izzy, Izzy's the man. He had a little bit of talent there, and I yeah. think he, he was part of the magic that was Appetite for Destruction. He was the hypodermic needle that injected everyone around him into great creativity for Guns N' Roses music. Adler, though, he recalls in his Appetite for Destruction by Stephen Adler that when it came to negotiating the equity of the band, that how much they would get for royalties, that they're all going to get 20% each. So five members of the band, 20% each. But Axel yeah. wasn't happy with this. So in a group meeting, They were all very stony and silent. They could have been wasted at the time and probably none of them remember this. But Adler piped up and said, we should all have 20%. And Axel went, no! (laughs) He demanded more. So Adler said, all right, I'll give Axel 5% of my 20%. So I'll take 15% so long as everyone else does it. Because Axel writes all the lyrics. So nobody else said anything. And in the end, Axel got 25%. The other lads got 20. And little Stephen only got 15%. What an idiot. Then talking about facts. Facts. On Appetite for Destruction, all of the band are credited with the lyrics. You've got Welcome to the Jungle, Guns N' Roses, Sweet Child of Mine, Guns N' Roses. That's right. There's, there's no individual credits. All that backstabbing bullshit, double talk and jive, take the money and run, motherfucker, came later. Exactly. Are we going to go with facts first or what do you want Let's to go do? with the facts, yeah. Yeah, it's been a month, I can't remember what was. I was sitting in the toilet yesterday going, how do we do this? <laughs> how do we do this again? It must be like when Ozzy goes back to Tony and goes, how do we do this again? And then in five minutes, they're jumping around playing paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> I have to talk about facts every single week. It's a fact. It is a fact. Facts. Tell us again. Appetite for Destruction so, is talk the over biggest you. selling talk, debut talk, album of stop, all time. Talking over you. Stop it. What? Stop it. Ah, what's wrong? Start again. You're not recording. I am. I just talked over your intro. Sorry. Don't do that to me. I was like Barry Talk Lang me. crashing the fucking start. No, Barry never did that. Who did that? That um, fat red twat who died. Simon Young. Yeah. Uh, Band of Call, Millie Vanilli. It's a great track. Girl. Facts. Appetite for Destruction is the biggest selling album of all time. So Ever. Sorry, for any, anybody's. Of, anybody's. of anybody's. Where, where are you getting your facts from? Appetite for Destruction is the biggest selling debut album of all time, leaving all time greats like Whitney Houston and Booty and the Blowfish in their slipstream. <laughs> Appetite for Destruction originally had very different artwork. It was a controversial image by Robert Williams. The same title, Appetite for Destruction, and it depicted a woman being attacked by creatures who had removed some of her clothing. No. The original artwork was a representation of the band, the Metal Avenger, rest back the power of the people from the system represented by the robotic rapist facts record shops covered the album in a brown paper and some refused to stock it all together so the record company Geffen quickly pulled the artwork and replaced it with the now familiar crucifix with all of the band members skulls designed by Billy White Jr facts Axel actually got his art tattooed on his arm he also said in a 2011 interview and this is where I think you and Axel would get on really well <laughs> now can I, can I before you continue and you know confirm it in the ears of our listener yes when I've been reading Adler's and McKagan's book there's some things that I find myself nodding along to when if they're disparaging towards Axel I'm nodding my head in, in opposition and saying no Axel might be right on this there's an yes, affinity um, there's an affinity there yeah, somehow I think so. <laughs> because Axel, despite the better of advice from his record company, who were complaining about this crass record cover, <laughs> wanted him to suggest a replacement. And Axel goes one better. He says he wanted a magazine cover photo of the Space Shuttle Challenger exploding in 1986 <laughs> as the cover instead. Even more tasteless. Yeah, I think Axel is the type of character that if he doesn't get his own way, then there's no way. Look, Axel, we don't offend anybody. And Axel, I found them all! Okay then, why don't we just get a cover with the space shuttle exploding and all those poor people that died on the cover? Yeah, that'd be a much better taste. Facts. I want to read you something quite quickly. It's an excerpt from McKegan's autobiography, and he says this. When I showed up at my first Guns N' Roses rehearsal in late March 1985, Axel and I said hi to each other and started joking around about this and that. I liked him right away. Whoever was running the sound then asked Axel to test out the microphone. Axel let out one of his screams, and it was like nothing I'd ever heard. There were two voices coming out at once. I have to talk about facts. 
fact. So when Axel's complaining, do you think when they're showing him the new artwork and they want to kind of tone down the original artwork, which way do you think Axel spoke? In his high screechy voice or in his low, it's so easy voice? I think it was the low, it's so easy voice. It's, it's not going to happen. Bitch yeah, I think we should put a, a, a photo of the spatial challenger. It's You're so great. Hey, 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 I think the original cover was his scream. Anyway. Fast. Daddy. Appetite. No. Was a slow burner. It didn't top the charts until a year after its release. You Could Be Mine, November Rain, Don't Cry and Back Off Bitch were already written before Appetite for Destruction was recorded. The total budget for making the album is estimated to have been around $370,000 and took around two years. Wow. At the time of making Appetite when they were scouting for producers that they thought they could get Mutt Lang. We've discussed Mutt Lang a few times here on our yeah, podcast. Yeah, I, I was getting to that in my next facts. You said the cost of making the album was $370,000 and Mutt Lang, who they wanted wanted to get his producer said Mutt wanted $400,000 just to walk into the room. He wanted more than the <laughs> the cost the album took to make. He wanted a cut of any future earnings from the record. All right, so he was gone, gone out the gap, so. Yeah. The band considered many producers for the album. Steven Adler loved Kiss growing up, so Paul Stanley was a candidate. Stanley came in and began providing input. Stanley suggested that the chorus of Night Train needed a pre-chorus hook. Everybody got a reason to live. That's what he wanted to put on the start of Nitro. <laughs> exactly that. That was game over in Axel's mind. And he got in Mike Klink, who was happy to record how the band wanted. Exactly. Yeah, good man. Mutt Klink. Lang was also in the running to produce. As we said. It was too expensive to hire. Yeah. And Nicky Seeks has since claimed he was also begged to produce. Uh, Nicky, Nicky's <laughs> one for the long tails, I believe. I've heard. <laughs> I have to talk about facts every single week. It's a fact. The sides of the vinyl were called G and R. Back in the olden days that we remember well, vinyl and cassette tape sides were named A and B. So side G had the aggressive songs and side R, or roses, has the love and the relationship songs. Aha, so that now explains everything how you were named because your father was looking at a cassette one day and he thought A, B, yeah. Your name has to be Adrian Burr. That's it. I was actually both sides. I'm a bit ACDC, are you? Both sides of the tape I was. Facts. Did you know no. Axel tried to beat up David Bowie during the It's So Easy video shoot? Yes, Bowie knows Slash as he once went out with Slash's mother and visited him on the set. Axel's ex-wife Erin Everly was appearing in the video. A little bit tipsy, old Bowie flirted with Aaron, and Axel tried to attack him physically and later verbally from the stage. So Axel went for Would the week. Would be happy to know yeah. these legends eventually made up? Did they? Yeah. David put the tongue in him. I'd hate to think of the Bowie and the Axel fighting. No, it would be not on. No, it wouldn't be on. They should all be going down to the strand for the jink. <laughs> Speaking of video shoots, a drunken Slash stole a motorhome being used for the making of the Welcome to the Jungle video. He didn't get the bar. You know, the motorhome lurched across the street, <laughs> made a U-turn and cut out. Uh, good man, Slash. Slash was later extremely yeah. apologetic. I think I'd be shocked if I read in the news, a sober Slash did something. I'd be like, what? <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> Facts. Now here's one you'll be interested in. The album was mastered with vinyl in mind to be edited with a razor blade applied to a two inch tape to be mixed by five people frantically pushing faders at a non automated mixing board. Oh, that We well. use classic instruments and classic amps, producer Mike Kling said. Our approach was reminiscent of stuff that was done in the 60s and early 70s. That's what Kling sounded like. Yeah. You have them to a T. <laughs> Actually. Facts. Did you know the dog in the video for Sweet Child of Mine belonged to Izzy Stradlin? The fact that the American Association for Cruelty to Animals didn't spot that one, that's, that's worrying. Maybe the dog was able to fetch his heroin <laughs> from the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would have been a handy he'd send, dog Izzy would send the dog outside And he'd come back with a strap of coke Tied to its stomach You know something That actually wouldn't surprise me <laughs> It was true Izzy According to Stephen Adler Axel recorded his vocals One line at a time An early sign of the perfectionism That would play a part In the later breakup of the band See that's it Axel was a bit of a perfectionist Yeah 
Back to Duff McKagan's autobiography, which I spent about two ninety nine on from Amazon. Uh, Axel had emotional and intense swings, marked by periods of incredible energy, followed by days on end where he would be overtaken by black moods and disappear and miss rehearsals. Since I had suffered from panic attacks since I was 17 and the only way out of it was to spit, oh, I knew all too well how crippling things like that could be. Axel and I talked together about it once in a while, and I told him about my panic attacks and my hawking and inability to stop spit, spitting. Uh, and I, I quickly realized that while each of us in the band had his own things to deal with, Axel's was closest to mine. A sort of chemical imbalance that he had no more control over than I did over my panic attacks. <laughs> One thing I found interesting about Duff when I seen him in concert a couple of weeks ago, he, he was very craggy and wrinkled and rubbery faced. But when I was looking at the album cover for Appetite for Destruction, he was probably the, the handsome member of the band. <laughs> like fucking hell. <laughs> That's what drinking ten bottles of wine every day and, and and taking heroin and all the other stuff he got up to does to you. And he actually went through a period of regeneration after he left Guns N' Roses. He got himself clean. He got himself fit as fuck. He got caught up with the whole thing. Yeah, it's like, you know, you, you take yourself an orange and you stick a needle into it and you suck out all the juice. It's still going to smell and look citrusy, but it's going to be a bit wrinkly and warty. He got caught up in the whole maelstrom of the success of Appetite for Destruction. That's why I'm glad, like, I've never come into huge amounts of money or... Don't worry, Adrian, you'll never have to fear rifle. or worry about being successful or understanding how to say that word, let alone live that word. Thanks for reassuring me. Absolutely, any time. It's definitely a great thing that's happened to you in your life of doing nothing. Because look at the alternative. Yeah, could be dead. Yeah. And that's the thing that surprises me about a lot of the albums that we look back on. There are a few dead lads along the way strewn about the place as we, you know, cast our eye back to the 80s and these classic albums. Look what it took to make them and look what it brought them. And half of them disappeared because of the success that it brought them. That people who suddenly come into money or, or success, it can go the other way. I'll posit this and let ye think of an answer. Some wise man said somewhere once that if the band came together from working class blokes, it'll usually break up in acrimony soon after. But if these chaps happen to be middle class lads, they'll seem to keep going and find a way to compromise and work together and maybe take breaks from each other and come back and maybe take in outside influences and mix and merge it and grow and adapt with each other. Coldplay, Pink Floyd... But the working class lads like Guns N' Roses, Oasis came, shot the load for a few and then came back with rubbish, split up. Yeah, in Blur still get on. There you go. Mm, Think about that. Still tour together. Yeah. Regular listeners to the show will know that we, growing up in Ireland on the East Coast back in the 1980s, where we were listening for the first time a lot of these albums, we first heard selected tracks of these through the BBC One Friday Rock Show between 10 and 12 p.m., hosted by Tommy Vance, and they had done so from 1978 up until its destruction by Matthew Bannister in 1993. But we listened to it every Friday night, and I've recorded many of them on those cassettes that Adrian so fondly talked about, those tactile, analogue, absorbing materials that we all love and still worship. And they'll come back soon sometime now I'm telling you no it won't okay this time on our Friday Rock Show chronological look back Guns N' Roses fit snugly into a see-through cellophane bag of 12 months coverage would you believe with 10 plays throughout the year 1987 as the band launched themselves onto the scene with a live EP and a fully flemmed split spandex bulging debut album so on the 23rd of January 1987 Guns N' Roses got their first national UK radio play do you know what song it was? I'm going to take a guess. Don't play it. The first single was It's So Easy. Now, let me remind you of your facts. When did you say that Appetite for Destruction was released? When did you say it was released? It was in August 1987. Now, on the 23rd of January 1987, Guns N' Roses got their first national UK radio play. What song do you think it is? And where do you think it is on? Move to the City. Well, that was a good guess. You just heard Guns N' Roses, they're a five-piece out of the States. It's uh, a track from an import which is on the Uzi Suicide record label, believe it or not. The album is called Live Like a Suicide. The track is Nice Boys, which is an Angry Anderson and Rose Tattoo song. Okay, that was Guns N' Roses on Uzi Suicide, that's an import. Nice Boys! Don't play rock and roll! I'll turn my head! 
Tommy followed that three weeks later on the 13th of February with a second track off this EP, although he was a bit confused. And also, Adrian's favourite band is mentioned at the end. The name of the band there are Guns N' Roses. It's a four-track album. It has the same songs on both sides. Live Like a Suicide, it's called. It's an import, and it's on the Uzi Suicide record label. Guns N' Roses from the States. The track here was called Move to the City. Direction. The track here was called Restless Life. Thank you, pardon. Guns N' Roses now signed to a major record label in the States doing their first proper album. Good band. Cinderella before that, whose album, their first album, has already sold two million copies in the States, and that's a lot for a debut album. Cinderella! They Adrian, were huge! They were Cinderella huge. were massive! They're not your B-list go-to band. Mehusive. Nearly four months passed, and not a snort nor sniff was to be heard from the band. But then, on June 5th, Tommy got them guns out of Hawk. Guns N' Roses. Now, so far, all we've heard of Guns N' Roses has been that four-track live import, which was really excellent. This is their new single. It's coming Maybe. off, uh, or is rather, off a forthcoming album. The album's to be called Appetite for Destruction. The mm. single by Guns N' Roses on, is on the Geffen record label. It's called It's So Easy. It's very good. Guns N' Roses are set, we believe, to do a major tour of the UK, possibly with Tesla this coming September. Tesla. But the word is out that they are going to be doing London's Marquee Marquee Club. Get it right, I've only been going there 20 years. London's Marquee Club next Thursday. I don't know whether that's accurate. I think so. At least I'm going to be there, because if they are, I want to see them. Excellent band. Guns N' Roses. 22 minutes past 10. <laughs> I've seen them, Tommy. They were deadly. You didn't see them back in 1997 in the marquee, don't be lying. Tesla invented electricity. Their first album is called Mechanical Resonance. And there's a classic album we look, must look back on, Adrian. Have you ever listened to it? No. It's So Easy by Guns N' Roses. That was the first single off Appetite for Destruction. And Tommy played it again three weeks later on the 26th of June. He loved it. He loved it. They have been gigging around and getting very good reaction. They do their final gig in this country this coming Sunday at London's Marquee. I'm told they're coming back in, well, around right about September to do a nationwide tour supporting Aerosmith, Guns N' Roses. The single is It's So Easy. And it's out on the Geffen record label. Another month passed and then came Guns N' Roses' fifth play on the Friday Rock Show on the 31st of July, 1997. Hosted this time by then Kerrang! Deputy Editor... Dante Benuto. As Tommy Vance got lost, again coming back from his holiday in Spain. First off, we had Guns N' Roses and Night Train, a track from their debut Appetite for Destruction album. And Guns N' Roses are currently spearheading a new movement out in Los Angeles, a movement of bands who are modelling themselves very much on Aerosmith, the likes of Faster Pussycat, Jet Boy, LA Guns, all of whom now have major record deals. Didn't Guns N' Roses kind of gain a cult following in the UK? Duff reckoned they were the replacement to Hanoi Rocks as the little kind of cultish band in the UK. That's right. We, uh, we've, uh, and now I will... Oh, re- <laughs> <laughs> oh fucking tell you. I oh, fucking had I rocks. Hot on the heels the following week on the 7th of August, a tanned Tommy was back in the studio. Mm, file the album under Mighty Tasty, because it is. And it gets better every time you hear it. The album's called Appetite for Destruction. It's the album by Guns and Roses. It's out of the moment. Track you have is called Rocky Queen, 1017, the rock show from good old Radio 1 here. How are you? So relaxed. Isn't it? It made it sound so easy. Serotonin coursing through his alcohol stream. <laughs> Five weeks later, on September 18th, Tommy was spinning the sleazy, sloppy, samey revolver once more. This is the Friday Rock Show from BBC Radio 1. Open the programme with Guns N' Roses, a CD version of a single called Welcome to the Jungle. Guns N' Roses, Yankee Band, as if you didn't know, and I'm sure you did. We'll be doing a short tour of the United Kingdom starting October the 4th in Newcastle. Then they do Manchester, Nottingham, Bristol and Hammersmith Odeon. The support act is Faster Pussycat and they've got a good album out as well. Guns N' Roses, Welcome to the Jungle. Two plays in October on the 9th and 23rd with Tommy addressing the prowess of the lads' UK live appearances. Now this is where it gets interesting. Prior to that, you heard a band that I saw last night at Hammersmith Odeon. They were excellent. Although, I have to own up, sometimes the music got a little bit samey, I thought, but at no time did they get boring. They really are a unit. They're a band and a half. Guns N' Roses and Rocket Green. The live version of that was even better than the version I played you from their CD called Appetite for Destruction. They were, they're a real band, a real unit. 
They don't phony up anything. Slash the guitarist, what an amazing character. You hardly ever see his face. He's kind of this, this uh, like a shaggy dog, incredible guy. They move across the stage a lot, and the vocalist has got exactly the same sort of voice, you know, on record as he had, has on stage. Nothing is phonied. No, nothing phonied about him. Recently on the stages in the United Kingdom, and I thought they were ace. A lot of people thought, though, a lot of people expressed the opinion yeah, that uh, Faster Pussycat were better than them. Well, I missed them because I went to see, uh, I went to see Guns N' Roses at the Hammersmith Odeon, and while Faster Pussycat were on stage, I'm afraid I was in the bar. Cannot tell a lie. Heard them. Well, sort of heard them. They were very good. But I like Guns N' Roses because they were raunchy. That's a track from their album called Appetite for Destruction, also available on CD, and you heard it on that system. The track was called Night Train. Raunchy, there's sake, a tag. <laughs> Raunchy. Do not just not have a drink for once and go and enjoy the music. You can have a beer at any time. And to round off this year of 1987, on Christmas Day 1987, Tommy played Guns N' Roses for the 10th time this year, although only the seventh different song from them. And listen out for our kindred spirits from that time, Adrian, if only. Went to see him in concert earlier this year. I thought they were absolutely exceptional. I really did. Guns N' Roses, a track from their first ever album. If you exclude the four-track live one that came, uh, or mini-album, if you like, that came out earlier this year. Haley and Rachel are well into Guns N' Roses, they say, in this letter from Red Ruth in Cornwall. The two 14-year-old girls who listen to the program every week and like it. Make uh, their Christmas very special. I trust I've done that. We're playing Mr. Brownstone by Guns N' Roses. There you go. Rock on, Thomas, and I shall. Happy Christmas, girls. Oh, Rachel! We were 14 back then too, Adrian. Is this feeling in my tummy wrong? Does he play them 10 times in 1988? Well, we're not going into that territory. We're only (laughs) focusing on Appetite for Destruction. That's the whole nexus of this show. This is Guns N' Roses' 1987. Uh, As heard in the British Isles on BBC Radio One's Friday Rock Show. But I can't leave it there. Although they were played another 40 times during the life of the Friday Rock Show until its curtailment by the stuffed shirts in 1993, Matthew Bannister. The standout show was in 1988 on August 19th, a pre-Donnington Monsters of Rock 1988 festival interview with the 26-year-old Jeffrey Dean Isbell, a.k.a. Izzy Stradlin. Alongside Dave Elfeson of Megadeth, this is always worth a listen. If you haven't heard this recently, Adrian, let me take your hand gently and pull you down memory lane. <laughs> At that stage of the game, were you all poor and living in what we call in the United Kingdom in squats? Squats. Uh, Is that like living with a chick or something, or what? (laughs) (laughs) Not quite, no. It's like living in a garbage can, I suppose, in the American time. Yeah, we did that for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't remember exactly that point in time, but I remember... uh, uh, Yeah, I don't remember, (laughs) man. All right. One of the members of Guns N' Roses actually threw up on the air. Well, he threw up in a bag, right? It was like a big scene, you know? But, I mean, it wasn't, I mean... It wasn't premeditated? No, well, he ate an artichoke and about seven gin and tonics and a couple of margaritas, and it just, you know... <sighs> but he did it real quick, slashed it, and just, you know, no big deal. We just kept, you know, did the interview, yeah. So it was Slash. That's the name we're looking for then, right? Yeah, that was Slash. <laughs> slash is the guilty party. Britain's favorite music station. Radio One. Welcome back to St. Michal's Home of the Bewildered, where two men reminisce of their teenage years and their love of rock music on Nostalgia. Nostalgia. Time is moving on, time is moving on here. Let's have a look at Appetite for Destruction. Track by track! Oh my god. Track one is Welcome to the Jungle. We've got fun Credited games. to Guns N' Roses. <sighs> Slash's guitar introduces this opening track and the album. Adler's drums kick in, Axel begins to howl, Duff is doing something funky on the bass, (sighs) Izzy is being busy, adding a layer to Slash's bouncy riff. Watch it bring you to your knees, knees, warns Axel as he introduces you to the pleasures and pain of living life on LA's Sunset Strip. Slash claims that the track Welcome to the Jungle was written in three hours. Mm. The jungle is Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Axel wrote the words while visiting a friend in Seattle, saying, It's a big city, but at the same time, it's still a small city compared to LA and the things that you're gonna learn. It seemed a lot more rural up here. I just wrote how it looked to me. If someone comes to town and they want to find something, they can find whatever they want. Welcome to the Jungle was the first <laughs> song Rose and Slash collaborated on. 
It all started in Slash's mom's basement, where Slash played the main riff for Axel, who was living there at the time. Axel would remember this riff later on when they were coming up with ideas for Appetite for Destruction. Rose claims the lyrics were inspired by an encounter he and a friend had with a homeless man while they were coming out of a bus into New York. Trying to put a scare into the young runaways, the man yelled at them, You know where you are? You're in the jungle, baby! You're gonna die! I met a chap and I had a similar encounter. There's a homeless guy asked me for 50 cent. I said, no, I don't have any money on me. And he said, I'm gonna fuck your children. And he ran away. That might have been a slightly different intro to Welcome to the Jungle. I have a feeling Axel would have went for that. Affinity? Yeah. Welcome to the Jungle was the second single off the album and it got to number 24 on the UK singles chart in 1988. One of rock's great intros to a classic album. Sorry, I must close the door here. The cat's just opened it. <laughs> he wants to get out I'll take the other pass Allow you to- <laughs> a few weeks ago Adrian and I were discussing the artistic direction of this show and Adrian was slightly worried that we were going to debase ourselves and be maybe slightly disingenuous sarcastic and annoying and irritating about our juvenile recollection of these classic albums that were released in the 80s well I think Adrian's come down to my level there's always the edit button Michael there's always the edit button welcome 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 to the jungle so track two, It's So Easy. And this is credited to Guns N' Roses and West Arkeen. Now this was released as the band's first single and was a double A-side with Mr. Brownstone. In his autobiography, Duff states it was about a time that the band had no money and they were living off hangers-on and girls. It just felt empty and easy. A credit goes to Duff's neighbour, Wes Arkeen, on this song, who taught Duff how to tune a guitar to open E. He never even knew Open E existed before this, and Duff claims without it, the song would never have happened. Now Slash also tried to explain the heartfelt sentiment that went into It's So Easy. Slash says, there's a lot to say for that period of time when you just start to lose the excitement of chasing chicks. You start going after really bizarre girls, like librarians and stuff, just to catch them and say I finally went out and caught a girl that wouldn't be my normal date. You read some of the quotes from the band and then Slash has a, has a totally different interpretation of what actually happened mm-hmm. or, or, what it was, or what went on. In Britain, during the late 90s, came a character called Pete Doherty and he allegedly played in two bands, one of which was the Libertines, I think. And everyone doubted that he actually existed, that he was just a media manifestation, that he was created as some type of ne'er-do-well scrounger, semi-homeless kind of artist around the streets of Soho. And one has to go back to 1987 Guns N' Roses and think, how did these bunch of reprobates get together and function, not completely just destroy themselves along the way? I'm sceptical, Adrian. I'm rubbing the beard. You think it was a conspiracy? I got my tinfoil hat on! No, I, I, I think it was genuine, and I think it's something that probably wouldn't happen today. And you read their accounts, they're just kind of five kids, and there's a lot of struggle involved as well. And obviously we, we read about Guns N' Roses' story. How many bands who took a similar path never got anywhere near getting a record deal, or if they did, they flopped, and, and what happened to them? It certainly was a long road for the Roses to get their guns. But, you know, basically they were ripping off Aerosmith from the early 70s. I don't know, I think Guns N' Roses, it's, it's like lightning in a bottle, it's like winning the lottery. I mean, you've probably hundreds of kids wanting to make it, and they were just lucky. They had the right kind of combination of being in the right place place the right time true the talent true. yeah and thanks to Guns N' Roses' success Steven Tyler and Aerosmith got the shot into the arm that those former junkies needed so the song itself It's So Easy some speedy bass picking starts this song and immediately is followed by those machine gun bass drums Axel is singing about seeing my sister in her Sunday dress and he manages to make it feel a little bit threatening <laughs> it also contains the immortal lyrics I see you standing there you think you're so cool why don't you just fuck off Examples of 80s rock misogyny are also found there with You get nothing for nothing, if that's what you do, turn around, B-word Oh please I got news for you <laughs> <laughs> So it's so easy, it got to number 84 on the UK singles chart So this was the first single off Appetite and it, it bombed No one knew who they were, what they were about, and no one cared. You often like to raise the point, would any of these lyrics be out of place today? Would they be treated for being misogynistic or sexist or racist? Axel himself does come under fire the following year, uh, in 1988, the slower version of You're Crazy, which we'll come to later. But it's funny because you have all these songs with misogyny, you've got all these swear words. When uh, they re-released Appetite for Destruction in the deluxe edition, that was the only song missing. That was the only song that they wanted to edit. The line in the sand is, is drawn there with the N-word. Black by track! 
Moving on swiftly to track three, Night Train. Ah. Uh, this one is credited to Axl Rose, Duff McKagan, Izzy Stradlin and Slash. What did you believe this song was about when you first heard it back in the day? Loaded like a freight train, flying like an aeroplane, feeling like a space brain one more time tonight. I thought it was about getting high and injecting yourself. Yeah. Train tracks, injecting heroin, mainline. I, I didn't even it. get that specific with it. I, I just thought it was these cool rock and roll gods getting out of their face uh, on coke and flying high. But actually, we were <laughs> this month old when we <laughs> discovered that Night Train got its name from an infamous brand of cheap Californian fortified wine, which was called Night Train Express. The equivalent in our country is Bookfast. They went out and got a bit of Night Train. I'm not familiar with Bookfast, but I have heard of it. Yeah, you're you're Uh, not from Dundalk. The Night Train drink was popular with homeless winos and the band. (laughs) (laughs) There's no distinction. Uh, The drink was popular with homeless winos and the band, as it was cheap and very strong. Slash describes Night Train as an anthem that we came up with on the spot. So the original idea for this song came when Slash and Izzy Stradlin wrote the main riff while they were sitting on the floor of the band's practice room. The next day, Slash was ill, so Stradlin finished writing the music with Duff McKagan. However, they did not write any lyrics. Oh. So the song remained incomplete until later, one night, the band were walking down Palm Avenue, sharing a bottle of Night Train, as you do, and someone started shouting, I'm on the Night Train! And the whole band joined in, with Axel improvising the lines in between. Bottoms up, fill my cup, all that stuff. Ready to crash and burn, (laughs) but I'll never learn. So after this drunken night of of brainstorming, Mm. uh, they managed to finish the song within a day. The first half of this song and the guitar solo and the lead intro is played by Izzy Stradlin. It's like Axel is rapping. Rap at the time, Run DMC and Aerosmith, they had got together for Walk This Way. If Eminem was sentient back in the 80s, he'd be rapping this out. He's a I got a Molotov cocktail with a master go. I smoke my cigarette with style. I can tell you, honey, you can make my money tonight. <laughs> Night Train was the fifth and the final single from the album, and it got to number 17 on the UK singles chart. I like this song. It's one of the good ones. Great song, and one they played live. Built to this day, and it's really good. In fact, when I seen them live, they played most of Appetite for Destruction. Nostalgia with Taylor and Bernie. I like it. Nostalgia! When you've seen them live. I have. Four times, Mick. No messing. Did I mention that? You never stop. You never... (laughs) You never stop. You never stop. I must have been strapped for cash back then and no one else had helped me out with a ticket. Stingy True Guns N' Roses fan here. Look at my tattoo. Mm, an upside down cross with five dog heads on it. <laughs> yeah, a beagle, a terrier, an Alsatian, uh, a St. Bernard and a Whippet. Anything more on Night Train? No. Track it, Adrian, track it. Appetite for Destruction, track four is Out to Get Me. Out to Get Me with its chorus of They won't catch me, I'm innocent. They won't break me. Is inspired by Axel's many run-ins with the law, going back as far as when he was a kid in Indiana. Ah, so you're reading the lyrics on the deluxe version that doesn't have the word fucking on it. Is that true? Did they remove that from the deluxe version? (laughs) They're out to get me. They won't catch me. I'm innocent. The duffer claims in his autobiography, the cops busted down the band's door one particular night looking for Axel regarding what turned out to be a bogus rape charge. And this led directly to the song's creation. So the song itself opens with a simple dueling guitar riff with Slash and Izzy before Slash slides down the frets. The opening riff is used in the chorus also. And let's give an honorary mention to some cowbell smashing on here. Uh, I have to have more cowbell. And obviously your favourite lyric. I'm fucking innocent so you can suck me. That's what I'd say to teachers and security (laughs) guards in music stores every weekend. See you in hell! I'm innocent! Bang on the cowbell. Dong, dong, dong. And they won't touch me because i got something I've been building up inside for so fucking long! And then they suspended me for a week. Then I had to apologise. And do you not think that the PMRC at the time were, were correct to getting those explicit lyrics, the warnings, parental guidance, labels put on those albums? Because look at the influence that had on you now. Getting yourself suspended from school. You just thought he was cool and yeah. rock and roll. Yeah. Can you say that to your teacher? Yeah. Disrespecting this poor man just doing his job. Or I'd like to say thanks to Auntie Tipper Gore and Granny Mary Whitehouse. <laughs> you can suck me! Ah, oh, you turned out all right in the end, sure. As we do this podcast for me in prison and you out in Freedom Land. I'll come and visit you, virtually. <laughs> virtually never! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you. 
track five is Mr. Brownstone. Well, I think so, if we were in any doubt as to what Night Train was about, I think it should be quite clear what Mr. Brownstone was about. Now, <laughs> when they said that the Rolling Stones' Brown Sugar was about black slavery on the plantations, are you slightly dubious? But Mr. Brownstone is as clear as cut crystal meth. I thought um, brown sugar was, was the sweeter option for my tea. Ah, yeah, that's how they sold it on Irish radio. Brown sugar. <laughs> Rolling Stones. If you're having a cup of tea right now, I'm hoping you're adding some brown sugar. Mick Jagger would approve. That's uncanny. And that's yeah, exactly so what Simon Young would have done after he'd released the, <laughs> the needle onto the platter. He'd gone and cacked his underwear. So, oh, that brown sugar in his tea. Give him bubbles. Obviously, Mr. Brownstone was written about Izzy and Slash's heroin habits. Mm hmm with the lyrics being roughly scribbled onto the back of a grocery bag before being given to Axel. Slash stated, and now we'll, we take anything Slash says with a pinch of sugar, <laughs> stated that is a statement about other people's drug habits. Sorry Slash, but you're on it yourself. Don't mess with me Slash. That's a great song this, Mr. Brown. So what a great chunky riff. And what oh, a great... It comes in with a shake and oh, a rattle intro. Brilliant. And slides into another glorious Slash riff. Dare I say, Rolling Stones influenced. And Axel goes down the lower register. And you get up around yep. seven. You get out of bed around nine. I don't worry about nothing. No, because we're to waste my time. And then he gradually goes up the octaves as his addiction leaves him more desperate. He used to do a little, but a little wouldn't do it, so a little got more and more. A very revealing lyric as to how addictions get hold. It ends, though, with a pang of regret. I should have known better, so I wish I never met her. When you get involved... Stay away from Mr. Brownstone! Black by Clack! Track six, and everybody knows this one, the classic Paradise City. Because we used to always go down to what we would call Paradise City, which was a small town called Arklow in the south of the county, where... Take me down to Arklow City, where the grass is green and the girls are shitty. And that's interesting, that. We'll come to that in a second. <laughs> okay. Slash has stated that Paradise City is his favourite Guns N' Roses song. It has the distinction of being the only song on the record to feature a synthesizer, which was played by Axel, who is also listed as performing Whistle on the credits. Now, Paradise City could have ended up being a little bit more vulgar and a lot less popular. Why, so, Adrian, no, tell us. During rehearsals, Slash hummed a pretty tune. Axel sang over it with the lyrics, Take me down to Paradise City. And Slash added, Where the girls are fat and they've got big titties. Luckily, the band outvoted Slash. Strap in the chair of the city's guest chamber. While well, I'm here, I can't quite remember. So that tells you all about how Axel felt his paranoia of being stuck in the city of LA. Why didn't go home? Get on the Greyhound bus and fuck off back to Indiana? He could have, but he didn't give up. He followed his dreams. And look what happened. He became a dictator and an Ayatollah for the <laughs> generation. The song itself speeds up to double time for the final two minutes, with the chorus repeated over Slash's solo. Yeah, it does go on a bit long, and that meant when we were headbanging on the dance floor of those youth discos in Arklow, it was quite the strain on the old bonds. And then afterwards, you're supposed to, when they slow down then for the slow set, you're a bit mangled and you're trying to get anybody. Oh, she's lovely. And you're walking around in a daze. You're dancing. <laughs> Paradise City got to number five on the Billboard Hot 100. Casey Kasem would have been introducing that. It was the first single to reach the top 10 for them. And it got to number six on the UK singles chart on the 18th of March, 1989. I used to love watching Casey Kasem present America's top 10. It reminded me of later on on BBC that there was Philip Schofield in the broom cupboard and he had a little sock puppet called Gordon the Gopher. And who did Casey have behind the podium? Was it Shaggy? Off the Scooby-Doo. That's right. Because he did the voice. Reggie? Ring the bell. Keep your hands in your pockets and keep fiddling with your balls, Adrian. That's right. See you next week on America's Top Ten. It's funny you mentioned going to Arklow and the discos. That does, when I think about it now, it does remind me of school discos and stuff and getting up and, and shaking the head around frantically for the last two minutes of Paradise City. And that Good times. moment of silence was brought to you by Wistfully. The new sound. So yeah, we're done with Paradise City. We're done. Done and gone. Dead and buried. Moving on. Mustache. This is Moshtalja. Albums that we love. Albums that were very important to us when we were growing up. I do remember my trip down to Arklow when I was getting in with the, the Arklow ladies. 
there was some kind of misunderstanding with one of our classmates from our town and sadly I happened to say something wrong to the ladies who were quite offended by his words and I may have reinterpreted them wrongly to the girls and then their lads from that town went and nearly put the poor chap in a coma. Sorry Gavin. You know, it was rough on South rough. Central Rath drum yeah. back in the day. We were going down and, and stealing their women. They didn't like it. So I went down, you know, swinging the cock on the shoulder, made friends with all the Arklow lads. It was wallflowers all afraid. We kept to ourselves. We kept to the tribe, man. But you know what? We didn't end up in a coma. Moshtalja with Taylor and Bernie. I love these guys. Suck in your paunch. Let's move on. We're deep into the R side of the album now. Roses. Track seven. My Michelle. And this is probably something that you maybe whisper often in your sleep. Yes, we will come to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, oh, we'll, come, we'll definitely come to that. We'll, we'll come to the point of, of our podcast first, which is to talk about Guns N' Roses and Appetite for Destruction. People don't want to hear me going on about myself. I think they do now. Uh, you've, you've established the brand of Adrian and people would like to know what's behind the dulcet tones of this assured presenter. Who is he really? The man behind the mask. My new podcast, Adrian. The loves and losses of the voice. You thought by the sound of him that he was ignorant, but he's not. <laughs> Your daddy works in porno, then and mommy's not around. She used to love her heroin, but now she's on the ground. Written as a tribute to Axel's friend, and her name was Michelle Young. They were listening to the car radio one day, mm-hmm. and Elton John's Rocket Man came on, and she declared that she wanted someone to pen a similar song for her. So Axel said, I'm the man for that. He tried to write a romantic song about her. But in the end, he settled on a more honest version. (laughs) And it referenced Michelle's real past and mentioned the song is the death of her mother, her father distributing porn films and her own struggle with drugs. Now, obviously, before it was released, Axel went to Michelle to see if it was okay, And she approved. But Michelle's story does have a happy ending. She cleaned herself up and moved away from L.A. to start a new life. And everything is hunky-dory now. So the song itself, My Michelle, on this, Slash uses a 1960s Gibson SG. Oh, the SG! Uh, Beloved by... Yes. <laughs> it gives it... A- <laughs> <laughs> you absolute ignoramus! Uh, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, so the reason he used the Gibson SG was to give it a more darker sound. So if you notice on the start of this, it's a foreboding horror movie style down, melody. Down, down. And actually, down, it reminds down. me a little bit of Maiden's Remember Tomorrow. Oh, well, I'm glad it reminds you of that. My Michelle, you were referencing that I might whisper this on lonely nights to my pillow. Mm-hmm. Because indeed... It wasn't Luther Vandross that kept you awake at night. <laughs> it was a different loser. <laughs> Yes, in secondary school, my first crush was a girl by the name of Michelle. And she was nothing like the girl in this song. Her daddy she didn't very, work in porno. And she was very innocent and she probably didn't drink or do anything controversial at all. <laughs> According to you? Yes, it, it was it was unrequited. It was one of those. and mm. You'll never forget the pang, the hurt of unrequited. She was a sturdy heifer. Corkscrew <laughs> hair, little round. How, how dare you describe Michelle Harry Potter heifer. round glasses. She was slim and had fantastic bone structure with blue eyes beneath those glasses and those corkscrew curls. Uh. And yes, she would have provided me with many offspring. I, uh, I think she was. She was. We need cheap tricks to flame to come in now. Uh, yeah, we don't want to go over this because it's still, it's still raw. It is. Know? So let's just not uh, bring up old wounds. Just, well, moving on to the next track. And this is probably what your Michelle was definitely not thinking about you. She was thinking about me as a friend. We were, we were good friends. You were in the friend zone back in the 80s. Like Are you we... going to rattle that knob any more times? I can't open the door! <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to! You've interrupted the, the recording of this podcast enough times when I'm trying to talk about a difficult subject. But Michelle, she did think about me, but just as a friend. And we had a good friendship. And do you know what? At the end of the day, I'd rather have her, her friendship than nothing at all. And tell me then, so we left secondary school in 1991. Did you continue to be friends? We did. We were in contact for many years after that. Until? You, uh, I'd say the you late told her, didn't you? You rang her up one night, scuttered. I think she moved to the city and had some nice boy experiences. <laughs> she may well have ended up like Michelle in the Guns N' Roses song, for all I know. Anyway. Black by twack. Think yes. about you. Squarely credited at Izzy Stradlin. 
This lyric probably expresses how I felt after Michelle. Wasn't much in this heart of mine, but there's a little left, and baby, you found it. Are you singing Brian Adams' lyrics? No, this is Think About You. It's only it love. Sounds, bam, bam, it's only love. It sounds really sweet, doesn't it? Except that Think About You wasn't written with a particular lady in mind. No, mm. no, 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 no. It's thought to be an ode to heroin. Ah. So it's so like Brian Ferry. It would be singing it. There wasn't much in the sun of mine, but there's a little left. Come baby, you found it. Izzy Stradlin is the band's number one heroin fan. He's on lead guitar in this track. He also wrote the lyrics and had them mostly complete before Guns N' Roses had even got together. He wrote the lyrics, he provided the backstory with his own experience. Slash and Axel have claimed that it was inspired by Finnish rockers Hanoi Rocks. So we get to the Stone Cold Classic track 9, Sweet Child of Mine. The catchy Where Do We Go Now lyric in Sweet Child of Mine was a case of serendipity. While recording the demo, producer Spencer Proffer suggested adding a breakdown towards the end of the song. The slightly confused Axel started talking to himself saying, Where do we go? Where do we go now? And Proffer said, Yeah, just sing that! And Sweet Child of Mine was born. The third single off the album and the band's first and only number one song on the US Billboard charts. And this cracked open the world for them. And it got to number 24 in the UK singles chart, only to be re-released in March 1989 and get to number six. Instantly joined the pantheon of annoying songs that you couldn't play in guitar shops. Number one on the list at that time. Stairway to Heaven. Mm, Smoke on the Water. You're just disagreeing with me for the sake of it. <laughs> well, no, when you go into a guitar shop to buy a guitar and you practice a riff, you're not going to practice fucking Stairway to Heaven, are you? Well, listen, I watch Wayne's World, right? You're going to go, dun, 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 dun. a big sign up in the shop saying, no Stairway to Heaven. Party on, dude! <laughs> so, uh, Sweet Child of Mine started out as a love poem to Axel's then-girlfriend, Erin Everly. She would be a daughter of one of the members of the Everly Brothers. Ah! Oh. Wake up, a little Susie. Wake up. I didn't, didn't, didn't do. Let's make a little Everly. Erin? Little Erin soup. It's originated as a love poem to Erin Everly. She became Axel's wife before they divorced in 1991. Mm-hmm. They were only married for around a year, 1990 to 1991. And apparently when the relationship split up and it became estranged, Axel was leaving little notes around the house for Erin with the words of Sweet Child of Mine slightly rewritten. Her hair reminds me of a cheating bitch. <laughs> See how easily you came up with that. You and, and pray Axel, kindred for the spirits. thunder and the rain. That's it. Sure, I remember you loved Axel flexing the old torso in one of your pictures uh, from abroad, <laughs> <laughs> where, you, where you had the bandana and the long hair and a ponytail down the back. Me and Axel, like fucking that. You loved him. Twin brothers are different mothers. Yeah, so uh, it started off as a poem. The poem got shelved because uh, Axel reached a dead end with it, locked it away. And oh. a few years later, Slash and Izzy got working together on songs. And Axel comes in, Izzy hits the rhythm, and all of a sudden, this poem popped into Axel's head. Mm. Everything just came together. Man. Axel calls this the first positive love song he'd ever written. And it's gone down in history as defining Guns N' Roses. This is their song. Yeah. It has joined those classic rock songs that'll be played for infinity. It'll always be there and people will always play it. Little chips straight into the eardrum. Press a button on your nose. And Mike Clink immediately knew it. That song made the hairs on my arms stand up, he told Q Magazine. It was magical. I'd safely say one of the greatest opening guitar riffs of all time. Also an interesting story behind that, Slash was supposedly imitating a steam whistle organ used in circuses when he came up with this. They were practicing one day, Slash was doing some guitar exercises during rehearsals and I think he was aiming it at Steven Adler and he was basically calling him a clown. <laughs> <laughs> well I'm glad that the intro of the Sweet Child of Mine didn't resemble Flight of the Cuckoo. <laughs> I think it was something similar. It was kind of clown music. <laughs> Amazing how it evolved into Sweet Child of Mine, to be fair. Yeah. 10. You're Crazy. You're Crazy was originally penned as an acoustic song before it was turned into a punk speed rocker. Inspired by the many groupies who came with the rock and roll lifestyle, which included some who were a few slices short of a loaf and only looking for a piece of the action, air quotes. Sadly, these women didn't want his love, just satisfaction. The F-words were not in the original, but happened more organically when they played it live. 
The story behind it being a girl in the audience attacked Axel with a beer bottle. She also clocked Duff on the head with a beer bottle as well. Now the slower acoustic version appears on GNR Lies. And this one is Slash and Steven Adler's favourite version. Listen to the power of his voice in that and how it beautifully slides on the acoustic. It's a wonderful song. Sped up. It's a bit of a thrasher. It's something to keep you going till the end of the album. And to say that we're still around lads, we're still motion. But no, wait until 1988's Lies version. That's a song. And coming now to a what's becoming a regular feature, it's misheard lyrics. What I heard these lyrics as was, Say boy, where are you coming from? With that dickhead point of view. <laughs> but apparently, it's say boy, where are you coming from? With that different point of view. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, did you think that as well? Oh, because it says here the lyrics, according to Google, say boy, where are you coming from? Where would you get that point of view? When I was younger, <laughs> said I'll use someone like you. But I like yours the best. Yeah, no, I think that's... <laughs> Where'd you get your works. dickhead point of view? Coming rapidly now to the end of the album and track 11, Anything Goes. There's an extra credit on this one to a guy called Chris Webber. Anything Goes is one of the band's oldest songs. It goes back to 1981 and was originally entitled My Way, Your Way. Yeah, it does it rip off Steven Tyler here with pants around your knees with your ass in the breeze. I mean, that was that's a Steven Tyler <laughs> lyric from back in the 70s. Rip off! Users! Steelers! Robbers! It was originally written when Axel and guitarist Izzy Stradlin were still in the Hollywood Rose with mm-hmm. guitarist Chris Webber. Hence the songwriting credit. Yeah, it's not exactly a songwriting credit really, is it? Because they don't really have many lyrics in it. It's a bit like a Beyonce album or a Rihanna album there's just my way your way anything goes tonight repeat it ad nauseum it's a bit simple it's Nothing filler deep it's filler in this. Nah. absolutely anything does indeed go tonight derivative rubbish track by track track 12 final song Rocket Queen oh, what an ending uh, it is this comes from Rose McKegan and Slash's brains <laughs> their creative pool you probably already know know this one, but the noises heard in the middle of Rocket Queen are real. They were recorded when Axel asked a girl named Adriana Smith. Adrian Smith? Who was Adriana, yeah, similar. Mm-hmm. She was allegedly going out with Stephen Adler around this time. That's why he left so Iron Maiden. Axel asked her, would she engage in a bit of a rumpy pumpy with him in the vocal booth? Purely for artistic reasons, Adriana agreed to do it. Simply, her terms were for the band and a bottle of Jack Daniels. But the actual Rocket Queen was a lady called Barbie Von Grief, a girl who Axel wrote the song for. She was only 18 at the time, a party lover and leader of the underground rock scene in LA. She was probably one of the girls the band lived off, as hinted in It's So Easy. Barbie hoped to one day form a band herself and call it Rocket Queen. And she also claimed she helped Axel write this song. I cannot verify that. And she was the Rocket Queen. And Axel did tattoo her face on his right arm. And now probably going a little bit distorted and blue in his ageing years. Was it her or Adriana Smith? I think it was Adriana Smith found it hard to live down the whole publicity about the, the incident in the recording booth. Had, had a very torrid time afterwards. I, I just have the image in my head because it was Stephen Adler's girlfriend at the time and Axel <laughs> invites her into the, the vocal booth and rides her and then plays the clown song again. Uh, Stephen <laughs> said, I rode your girlfriend. I just have visions of Axel going in with Adrian Smith. He was a stranger in a strange land. <laughs> Adrian started singing Wasted Years. Rocket Queen starts off with just a drum beat. Duff kicks in with some seriously funky bass. The reason Duff is probably so good is his eclectic influences. Mm -hmm. He cites everyone from Soul to The Clash. This song has a split personality with its sex fuse opening, followed by a time change just under three minutes to a more heartfelt, shall we say, ending. The lyrics also contain some hopeful notes. If you need a shoulder or if you need a friend, I'll be there standing until the bitter end. Then we get good old Slash with another solo before Axel leaves us with his final words. All I ever wanted was for you to know that I care. <laughs> Guns N' Roses would later go on to push this more progressive side even further with the likes of November Rain. Yep, closing it with such a really strong track leaves the feeling in the listener that, you know what, I really enjoyed that album. So I'm either going to play it again or, or you have the feeling, I can't wait to see what Guns N' Roses do next. And I remember late 1987, standing with you at the jukebox in the local chip shop during lunchtime. <laughs> so romantic. And your Michelle walked in and you wanted to play Guns N' Roses and show that you were cool, that you liked this new music. And you know what she said? And she heard That's the music. <laughs> (laughs) 
And then she got a bag of chips and fucked off. <laughs> and you were crestfallen. No, we should have went for Madonna crazy for you. You were it. tugging at your black trousers. I think you're going to enjoy this, Adrian. You, Good. In the space of 13 issues in 1987, Guns N' Roses hijacked Kerrang, dragged it into an alleyway, spat at it, and left it crazed and abused. Yes. Guns N' Roses never got a cover mention until they were astride the cover on June 11th, 1987, in astride. issue 148. Now, let me go back to my discussion about Pete Doherty and Guns N' Roses coming out of the blue. They had never been mentioned in Kerrang up until they were <laughs> on the front cover with a cover spread and an interview. Welcome to the jungle, lad. Ads, and only the first of two cover stories in all of 1987. You wouldn't see nor hear of them again on the cover until their first ever cover mentioned for a gig a year later in June 1988. Yeah, you're going all Alex Jones and this conspiracy that Guns N' Roses were manufactured in a period out of nowhere. Yeah, the first that UK readers came to know of this salubrously oozing five piece was in issue 138, January 1987, and an album review by Xavier Russell of Live Like a Suicide, saying that the sleaziest record to come out of Smog Angel since Motley Crue's Too Fast for Love debut LP. Delete Poison, because guns and posers are far more happening. Hell, they're currently recording an album for Geffen Records out sometime soon. The following issue, 139, told us Guns N' Roses were recording in Rumbo Studios in LA with producer Mike Klink. In May 1987, issue, in issue 147, their first single from Appetite for Destruction is released and reviewed. Derek Oliver tells us to hail the conquering heroes. Guns N' Roses are here to teach us where it's really at. Whether it's wandering, booze-soaked, sass, true to a grand tradition, or blow-your-face-off guitar-drenched R&B, Guns N' Roses perfectly master the form. In this particular instance, however, the A-side is pretty naff, all deep grunts and non-starter riffs. So better for you, dear reader, to clock the flip side. Cool, what a scorcher, as Mr. Brownstone is on the B-side. Yeah, it was an unusual choice. I mean, there were so many better songs, and Mr. Brownstone is a lot better song. So then came the front cover, the band strewn all over each other on the floor, and an interview with Sylvie Simmons. You should really hate us, lead guitarist Slash says, because we're real. You see, trying too hard, Axel. Slash, lads. <laughs> Rhythm guitarist Izzy Stradlin says their debut album is going to, uh, I don't know, man, uh, kick ass. Axel likes to say he sings in five or six different voices that are all part of me. They're not all contrived. He goes on to say there's a track on the album that's Black Sabbath Goes to Ireland. There's two guitar players that play very different to each other. Simmons says at the end that Guns N' Roses are roarer than a horse ties and toxic as rock and roll was always meant to be. Black Excellent. Sabbath Goes to Ireland. Why didn't you just say Thin Lizzy? A rotten gig review at the Marquee in London by Xavier Russell in issue 150 with a performance leaving him in a very confused state. It was Guns N' Roses' first UK appearance and the first of three nights at the Marquee. Guns N' Roses blew it. Pure and simple. Some punters down the front obviously saw through the bullshit that was spewing forth and proceeded to spit and throw the odd can of beer at the lead singer W. Axel Rose, who returned the compliment by saying, Fuck you, pussy! <laughs> Well, you'd have, love to have a time machine now and go back to the marquee, back in the day, and see Guns N' Roses, young and raw. Finally, in July 1987, issue 141 brought us Howard Johnson's review of Appetite for Destruction, a 5K killing machine. Start licking those lips, sleaze pleasers, for rock and roll is being most definitely wrested from the hands of the bland, the jaded, the tired, the worn, and thrust back into the hands of the real raunch rebels. It's amazing, really. How they've done it is a mystery to me. Writing songs so infuriatingly catchy. This is the most exciting rock release of the past three years. Not hyperbolic. You lot know that I'm hardly the most liberal man on earth when it comes to dishing out the magical 5k accolade, but in the case of Appetite for Destruction, I have no hesitation in letting it all hang out. So in the same issue, Malcolm Dome was at the second and third marquee gigs to tell us the general negativity in the media towards his five-piece following their debut British gig smacked of backlash to Malcolm. But since he was absent from the date, he couldn't comment on the boys' performance that night. But he was there on the succeeding two nights, and if the second concert was sensational, then the final one was beyond even such a superlative. Izzy and Slash tore their flesh to golden shreds on the strings of their guitars, as if ripping out a cat's innards. 
and then street orchestrating the screaming effect. Bassist Duff possesses a sunken, glowering glow, while drummer Steven Adler monkey kicked against the skins as if attempting anchored surgery without anesthesia. And holding the instrumental plunder together is Axel, a born frontman who just happens to have a positively schizoid vocal range. Their unbelievably depth charged totalitarian debut album, Appetite for Destruction, has the mescaline magnetism of Paradise City proving to be the night's highlight, sucking everybody into the virile vortex of its already classic personality. <laughs> So it was good then. Crying quote. Their second cover story came in October 1987 in the now weekly Kerrang issue number 157 with oh. the soon. Was Kerrang fortnightly or it monthly? It was, yeah. It was monthly at the start for about two years. Then it went bi monthly and then went weekly in 1987. Such just was the in popularity of rock at the time. They went weekly as soon as I started subscribing. Once you ordered it from Lily Cals, that was it. Or <laughs> weekly, that was... I said, there's one man in Ireland who wants to subscribe. So, in the now weekly Kerrang! issue number 157, with the soon-to-become iconic cover of Axl Rose, snarling, eyes slammed shut into the microphone, a Ramones t-shirt on, hair high and wild, tattoos ablaze, with the heading, Rumble from the Jungle. That sounds like a boxing fight. And that was it for Guns N' Roses in Kerrang! in 1987. <laughs> From out of nowhere. They were the real thing. But how does any band become famous? They obviously start from somewhere, they get their record deal. The record label has to generate some sort of hype for them. Your man Geffen calling MTV to get Welcome to the Jungle played once at a decent time slot. And they only got it played once at 2am. <laughs> And yet people were watching. But that's all it needed. Yeah. Because that's when their target audience was awake, sitting in the underpants, <clears> empty <throat> cans of scrumpy all across their mattresses, ashtray full of ganja. Next minute they hear this amazing song cutting through the Cindy Loppers and the Dire Straits. And they're like, whoa, dude, this band are awesome. The noise around them gets bigger and bigger and people take notice. If you look at Metallica's rise, you'll hear and see how Kerrang! would have covered them, how they appeared on the Friday Rock Show. But in Guns N' Roses' case, they seem to just drop out of the sky fully formed. <laughs> According to the books that we have read and brushed up on for our retrospective here on Guns N' Roses, it would seem that they were organically just shunted together by accident and bonded on one specific trip up to play a gig in Seattle. And that became the team. And they were going to Cantor's. Mark Cantor became their photographer. They were hanging out at all the famous places in Hollywood. The Whiskey A Go Go became their go-to place. You think it was a bit sudden? Maybe it was just the right time, the right place. It's not the wand, it's the wizard that uses it. That's what you said that night on the phone call to Michelle. That's what I said last night. Appetite for Destruction. A great album... Well, it came out when we were 13. Our whole lives still ahead of us. Hope. No responsibilities. Endless possibilities. Looking out the window on a rainy day <laughs> thinking... <laughs> this could be mine. You could be the mine. The world is my oyster card. Our light was yet to be dimmed by reality so cruel. He'll have me weeping into my microphone. <laughs> so, appetite for destruction. That's given me an appetite for lunch, because we've been doing this for a long time and I'm hungry. <laughs> but Guns N' Roses, they rock. Oh, what a great name it is as well. Appetite for destruction. Of all the other... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen... This... Thinking hard, oh yes. What a great name. Mm. I'm pondering this. <laughs> destruction and the appetite for it. It's amazing. I am the Richard Dawkins of heavy metal nostalgia. It's an insatiable appetite to destroy everything, to control everything, to own it. What cost? Such a draw into their world comes at the very start with the name of the album. The band were full of hunger. Destruction of their speakers. <sighs> Okay, that's it for another edition of Moshtalgia. I hope you enjoyed our rediscovery of Appetite for Destruction. Join us again soon as we tackle another rock classic. Dig it up, prod it, buy it a few drinks, and we'll tell you what we think. Let's just see if it brings back more painful memories of love's lost and unrequited love of the past. Let's reopen some of them wounds. Oh, don't worry. We've many wounds to show. This is your god. This is no dream. The freaks are out tonight. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ! Fuck! Me! Ah, Jesus! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming for
for you. 